God, I thank you for the, the breath in our lungs so that we can praise you. Lord, everything flows from you. Everything comes from you. When we gather and praise you together, we're just giving back what you've already given to us, freely given to us. that our praise would be a sweet sound to you, a pleasing aroma to you. Lord, as we continue in worship this morning, that our hearts would remain here, that our hearts would remain on you, that distractions would fade away. obedience for your word. Dear Lord, in your name I pray. Amen. Whew. Good morning, church. We are going to take this time now for our offering... Just like we sang with the doxology, the Lord freely gives to us so that we can give back to him what is already his. So as we worship an offering, we have a few different ways that you can do that this morning. You can text the word give to the number on the screen. It's 844-967-2043. You can go to our website, which I hope you saw in our announcements this morning. Um, cityoflightelmira.com and click the give button on that screen. You may also give with check or the envelopes. Um, checks can be made out to City of Light and those things can be placed in the boxes as you leave through the same doors you came in um, this morning. There's two boxes on either side of that main door and you can give there as well. Good? Great. Now, I'm going to release the children. So if the children and the teachers could come forward, um, we're going to pray over them. We're going to pray over our students 
and pray over our teachers as they go from here. Um, this, this part of our worship service just blesses my heart every single Sunday because there's so many kids. It's so good. So as they go, if you could um, just extend a hand to them um, and bless them as they go from here. Bless these teachers as well. Dear God, I thank you for who you are. Lord, I thank you that your word does not return void. And I thank you that you tell us to train up a child in the way that they should go. And they will not depart from it. So Lord, as these teachers teach the things that you've laid on their heart for this week, I just pray that you bless them. Give them just such a spirit of recall. And be with these students as they listen. Lord, we can learn so much from children. But it's because we teach them. <laughs> and you teach them, Lord. So as they go, teach them and allow them to recall these things as they go to their homes and schools and different places that they go so they can be lights for you just as we want to be lights for you. Be with them as they go from here. Amen. All right. <laughs> Look at them go. So this morning, we have a, a, just an interesting thing, and it's interesting for me too. Um, we're all going to preach this morning. Um, <laughs> Apparently, this is a thing. I didn't know it was. Um, so I will let Jahara take it away. And uh, you'll hear from all of us eventually. Praise, Praise God. Oh, no, no, Carmen said. And you're not going to be here till 3 p.m., amen? You, you're not going to be here till 3. You're not going to be here until 3. Um, but, but I'm excited, amen. For some of you, this is um, not uncommon for Others, this may be the first time you've experienced what we call, um, when I was growing up, platform preaching. And so um, each of us will, will present um, a portion to you from what God has shared with us. But before we get into this space, um, can you just easily guess what this week's, we're, we're in week four of this series, What Are You Afraid Of? And this one should be easy. Sister Anita, you should have had this one. Where, where is she? There she is. You should have had this one like a long time ago, right? This is an easy one. This is an easy one for week four in our series, What Are We Afraid Of? What, what, are, we, what are we talking about here? It's pretty simple, right? <laughs> pretty simple. Um, yeah, this, this, this fear of dogs. Um, it's, it's real. It's real. But, but so I, I want to get moving so that, so that everyone has an opportune time to share what God has given unto them. But so just so that you don't have to guess, I'm going to tell you that our title for this morning is built around a warning found in Philippians, the third chapter. The title for this week's message is, is, is built around a warning found in Philippians chapter 3. And, and within this third chapter of Philippians, Paul makes a rather unusual statement. And in this third chapter, Paul says, Sister Ellie, for the church at Philippi to beware of dogs. It literally says that. In, in this third chapter, he says to beware of dogs. And so I shared this with a sister of mine, and she said, what? <laughs> That's in the scripture. I say, yep, it's in there. It's in there. And, and, and Philippians chapter 3 is where we're going to pick up today, but I'd like to share with you a little bit of background first. And this Paul's letter to the Philippian church is a very unique letter. It's one of the very few, if not the standalone letter, where Paul did not have to hand out a good old-fashioned Pauline epistle-type tongue lashing. It's one of the very few. This is maybe the only letter that did not include the standard New Testament Pauline fussing out. Somebody's like, so what does, what does that mean? That leads me to believe that the Philippian church, by all means and standards, was doing good. 
That that leads me to believe that the Philippian church, by all means and standards, had to be doing good. This was a church that was in overall good standing. A church that was loving well, Brother Dave, living well, and yes, P12, they were even listening well. And I would be lying this morning if I said that this is not my personal prayer, that City of Light Church, along with every church in the county and every church in the nation for that matter, would be considered a church that by all means and standards is doing good. I'm I'm telling you, though, personally and and, and selfishly, maybe, that if every other church doesn't want to do good, my personal desire is that City of Light Church would strive to be like the Philippian church, a church, Brother Shandon, that was doing good. And since they were doing so good, Paul decided to write a letter to encourage them. Sister Katie, he wanted to encourage the church at Philippi, and he wanted to encourage the people in it. Simply put, Sister Shauna, they were doing well, and Paul wanted to encourage them to keep on going. Amen, somebody. Because the last thing you need when you're doing good are any distractions, any divisions, any detours, or any discouragement. That's the last thing you need when you're doing good. But Paul knew, brother preachers, that the distractions, the divisions, the detours, and the discouragements were going to come a dime a dozen. So he decided to take his time and encourage them. Can I ask you to take just a couple seconds out of your oh-so-busy schedule today and prophesy over somebody this morning, and I want you to just whisper to them these words. Because you made it here this morning, you're simply doing good. Can, can you, can you, I know you're busy, I know you got your own stuff going on, but for the next few seconds, can you just prophesy over somebody's life and simply tell them, because you made it here this morning, you're doing good. That, that might not mean nothing to nobody, preachers. That might not mean anything to anybody, but to somebody, because all of the things that tried to keep you home this morning, you understand what was just spoken over you. In spite of all the excuses that tried to keep you in the bed this morning, you made it here, and we want to encourage you that you're doing good. Even though, even though, Sexton family, I'm going to be honest, this has probably been a two weeks like no two weeks you've ever lived, but keep on going. You're here, and today you're doing good. I'm not saying that bad things didn't happen. I'm not saying that it wasn't tough, but I'm telling you that even though the enemy thought he had you by the neck, somehow you kept on going and you made it here. You got to go back in time once in a while, preachers, and remember the fact that the last time you thought you wouldn't make it, you made it. The last thing that you thought was going to take you out didn't. Hmm. Can you just whisper to somebody, you're here today, and because of that, you're doing good. You're doing good. The enemy thought that last thing was going to take you out. He thought that last trial was going to break your faith. But here you are today, and because of that, you're doing good. And so, and so, so, so Paul is, is, is recognizing that the church of Philippi is doing good. <laughs> and he said that I just want you to remember here, City of Light, that you thought you never would have made it, but you kept on going. And somebody just needs to be encouraged this morning. So Paul keeps on encouraging the church, Brother James. He keeps on encouraging them. And so, and, and this Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, he says to the church, he which has begun a good work in you. <laughs> will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. He's simply saying, for those of you that don't read KJV, he's saying God finishes what he starts. So if he started blessing you, he's going to finish it. If he started you on the journey, he's going to finish the journey. But listen, the enemy, I don't believe, was happy because Paul was encouraging the church. But Paul says, I'm not worried about what you say, enemy. He goes on to tell them in chapter 2, verse 5, to let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. He was encouraging the church, Brother Harold, to let all the other names fade away and take on the mind of Christ. So the encouragement will continue to the, to the 10th verse of chapter 2, where Paul boldly declares this. He says, at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. 
of things in heaven, of things on the earth, and things under the earth. The last time I checked, every knee still included every knee. Sister Nikki, that means that the knees of the enemy that's attacking your mind has to bow. That means that the knees of the enemy that's attacking your spirit has to bow. The knees of the enemy that's attacking your family all have to bow under Jesus Christ. So Paul is encouraging. Can you tell somebody this is all right because this is full of encouragement? So here we are, right, in chapter 3 where we're going to pick up. One chapter away from the benediction, Paul is on a roll right now. He ain't mad. He ain't yelling. He's simply encouraging them. He's plainly giving thanks for them. He's exhorting them. He's declaring triumph over their lives. And then something happens. Then Paul says here in chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, these words. He says, finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. This is verse 1. To write the same things to you, to me indeed, is not grievous, but for you it is safe. He says, to keep, cur- to keep on encouraging you, Sister Shauna, is not a pain for me at all. But I want you to do this one thing, Shante. I want you to beware of dogs. After all this encouragement, Sister Anna, he says, beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the concision. Verse 3 says, For we are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Jesus Christ and have no confidence in the flesh. So look at this. Right smack in the middle of this good old encouragement, he tells the church to beware of dogs. So the word beware is one that can create fear all by itself. Or at its least, it will draw you towards a clear warning. Beware. Halloween is full of warnings. Don't eat this candy. Don't eat that candy. Beware of ghosts. Stop only at houses with lights on. Read every one of the signs. Do not enter. Caution over here. Beware of this. Beware of that. I can remember listening to a sermon by an old pastor named B.W. Smith Sr. And this old preacher was warning his church, just like Paul warned his church, to beware of dogs. And so since then, I've tried to have this conversation once per year within the church. If we have some honest people in here today, how many of you are honestly afraid of dogs? They told me church is a good place to be honest. Raise their hand high. We're not, we're not, we're not, we're not mad at you. Amen. Amen. So this extreme fear of dogs is called xenophobia. Xenophobia is the extreme fear of dogs. And so according to this website, verywellmind.com, it says, like most animal phobias, the fear of dogs is, is most commonly caused by a negative experience with a dog often occurring in your childhood. So Paul warns the Philippian church, brothers, to beware of dogs, to beware of evil workers. Was Paul literally talking about an actual dog here? Or was this morning meant to be a little bit deeper? Because most dogs we encounter are are considered man's best friends. Right, McCarty? We love our dogs. And they seem really cute and cuddly and friendly, and um, they seem completely unlike the dog that Eric is going to bring in right now. They are completely opposite of this type of dog. There ain't no dog coming. <laughs> you guys think I'm that? I, I, listen, I, 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 don't put it by me. Don't put, right? I, I, I wrestled with this. I thought about it. I, I, I was close. I was, really, I was really, really close. I was close to doing it. I was close to doing it. I was close to doing it. But they told me that I broke some OSHA rules sitting on that ladder, so I'm like, I don't know. I don't want the animal control here. So, but Paul wasn't referring to an actual dog. He goes on to give some details, and, and we're going to walk you through this text. He says, beware of these evil workers. Beware of the concision. What is the concision? What does this mean? The concision, the concision. In Greek, this word is called katatome. And they were defined as mutilators. Those who took joy in maliciously cutting things up. Oh, we're finna get there in a minute. 
These dogs, these evil workers, this concision weren't only looking to cut and mutilate flesh. They were also hoping to cut and mutilate the church into little useless pieces. Oh, we're going to get there in a minute, Brother Bruce. These dogs, these evil workers, as Paul would call them, they would not be just content to cut up the church in little useless pieces, but they would go on, Brother Kevin, to cut up families, to cut up households, to cut up communities, and to teeny useless little pieces. They really didn't care. Hmm. The concision. So I'll stop by to tell you this morning that the attacks on the Philippian church and the Philippian community were no different then than they are now. We're still under the attack of evil workers and people with bad motives. I stopped by to tell somebody today, along with my panel of preachers, to beware of dogs. So for anybody who's been around a dog, you've probably seen or at least heard it said that dogs can take on rather human-like characteristics, right? They can take on rather human-like characteristics and habits. So I, I found some photos. Actually, Brother Jeff found these photos and almost ruined the whole group thread that we got. Um, Gerard Gethins took these photos, and I thought this was pretty powerful. Can, can we? Look. Yeah. <laughs> this is crazy. <laughs> My goodness. <laughs> Absolutely crazy. Absolutely crazy, right? So, so, so who, who would have really thought that these dogs can take on these human-like characteristics and habits? Um, but the opposite is also true, you guys. Humans can take on some rather dog-like habits and characteristics. Humans can take on some rather dog-like characteristics and spirits as well. I know some of you are probably thinking, I'm reaching, that a human being acting like a dog, I don't believe it. If you guys don't have, I got a, three witnesses with me. <laughs> Stick with me. Human beings actually taking on dog-type spirits. So this particular warning, really quickly, it was given over a thousand years ago, but it's still relevant today. So though this initial warning was written unto the church and to the people at Philippi, this might apply to the people at your school. It might apply to some of the folks at your job. It may apply to some cousins in your family. And somewhere in these definitions, you might wind up looking yourself smack dab in the eye. People taking on some dog-like spirits. So Paul says, beware of dogs. Can you just whisper to somebody really quick, watch those dogs. Watch those dogs. So, so if you don't suffer from xenophobia, I'm, I'm not sure if you'll take this warning seriously enough, but I want you to keep in mind really quickly that whenever Scripture was speaking about dogs, they were not the same tame, domesticated dogs of today, but instead they were impure, feral creatures. And, and in this specific case, Paul was referring to a spiritual impurity and people with impure motivations, people who had habits like that of a dog. Ready to jump into this series? Paul was speaking in general when he was speaking about dogs, but for the next 40 minutes, we're going to get a little bit more detail. Is that all right? So my co-belaborers and I are going to share with you just a few types of dogs you might want to be aware of, and then we'll be on our way. First type of dog that we're going to talk about here that you might want to be aware of in the church, in the community, in your family, and, and you is a hunting dog. I want to talk about a hunting dog. I want to be aware of these hunting dogs. So hunting dogs come in, in many different types, but today we're going to talk about a specific bird dog called a pointer. Track with me, Brother Harold. A pointer. Now a pointer is not a killing dog. A pointer is a pointing dog. And his job 
is to go into the brush, Brother Steve, to go into the thickets and to find whatever he's been sent to seek out. And when he finds it, Sister Tammy, all he simply does is point. And after he points, that's the signal for the hunter to go in and kill him. <laughs> There's some people in life that are like this. They go around the whole church and they point out the sins of everybody. They point out everything they see wrong. I believe you should be doing this. I actually seen them doing that. I can point out exactly what you're doing wrong. I can point out who was out last night, how late they were out. I know exactly whose fault it is. I can point out who struggles with what, who's dating who. I can point out who got caught doing it and what they got caught doing. These are pointing dogs. Now notice, pointing dogs don't do no killing. They just do a whole lot of pointing. Judas was a world-famous pointer. He said, to the one whom I give a kiss. <laughs> but notice, he didn't kill Jesus. He just pointed him out to be killed. Some of you guys ain't killing anybody. You're just pointing out all of their stuff so that they can be killed. Preachers, beware of them pointing dogs. <laughs> ne next, we have this group called a pack dog. A pack dog. Sled dogs and wolves are two good examples of pack dogs. The thing about pack dogs is that they work well, but mainly in a group. <laughs> oh, man. That is to say when... Other members of the pack are around. Pack dogs are extremely confident. It's said that a pack of wolves can take down prey as large as an elk, but they only kill rabbits when they're by themselves. Oh, I'm meddling now. A pack of sled dogs can pull up to 1,000 pounds. Put them by themselves, maybe they can only pull 40. There are some people around us who carry the pack dog spirit. How will you know if somebody carries this pack dog spirit? Because these folks seem to be real confident and dominant when they're with their pack. They treat you a little bit differently when the group is around. I want to know this this morning, church. Are you just as humble in the pack as you are in private? Are you just as humble in the pack as you are in private? The other thing that's troubling about pack dogs is that they rarely ever let any new members into the pack. Oh. If you ain't afraid of dogs, you got to be mindful of these ones. Tell somebody, watch out for those pack dogs. Watch out for those pack dogs. Brother Anthony is going to share our next two dogs you might want to be aware of. So when Pastor J. Harris said we were doing this, I was like, I got the two perfect dogs because the two dogs that I picked are actually dogs that I encounter on a daily basis. That's right. You can learn from the very pets that you have in your home, right? So the first dog, I have a one picture. We're going to pop up on the screen there for you. That's my dog, Marvel. He's going to be five years old in November. That picture doesn't really does the size justice. This dog can sit about to my hip. That's how big he is. He weighs almost 200 pounds and still thinks he's a lap dog. I promise you, he still thinks he's a lap dog. Let me, let me tell you a little bit about, what the, about the breed, the English Mastiff. Uh, they often functioned as a war dog. The English Mastiff fought alongside British sol soldiers in 55 BC. Caesar brought a pack of Mastiffs to Rome where the dogs were put on display as arena gladiators and forced to be in fights with human gladiators, lions, bulls, bears, and in dog-to-dog -dog combat. They later became popular with the peasants in England where they were used as bodyguards, protectors, protectors from the wolves, any other dangerous predators, and a very great companion dog. That's pretty scary of a dog, don't you think? And that one's 
sleeping in my house right now. <laughs> but they're known to be fierce and mighty warriors. But the one thing that an English Mastiff and that breed can be known for is being lazy. Go ahead and pop that other picture up there of my dog in my bed with a blanket over. Now, he didn't put the blanket over. I did. But he stood there and he sat there for literally like 30 minutes and just laid there. This is what my dog tends to do all day. Just lay around. He's known just to be that lazy dog. All right. So this morning, I want to talk to you about the lazy dog. When my dog doesn't want to do something, he's not going to do it. So when I mention the word lazy, I don't mean just lay around doing nothing. I'm talking about laziness to a point of stubbornness. You try to get a 200-pound dog to walk when he doesn't want to walk. And it never starts at the beginning of the walk. It starts at the middle of the walk. So we're two blocks down, and he sits down. I'm done. I quit. You try moving that dog. It's not going to happen. It's like moving a, a person, a big person. You try stopping my dog when he wants to chase after something like a squirrel or a cat. Now, I got really strong, really walking my dog because I'm literally doing this half the time. But it's laziness to a point of stubbornness. It's funny. When I saw that, something kind of clicked in my brain. The reason why the English Mastiff can become lazy to a point of stubbornness is quite simply because his feelings can get hurt. Something could be said negative about him. I know from firsthand, if you say something to him like, no, he's in the corner, giving the longest face you've ever seen in your life and doesn't want to be around anybody. And he won't move from that position. It's laziness to a point of stubbornness. So when I'm talking about lazy, I'm not talking about the dogs that are just lazy to be lazy. When I'm talking about the being, being aware or being bewaring the dogs that are lazy, I'm not talking about the ones that just don't do anything. This is a problem for the church. We encounter people on a regular basis that are lazy to a point of stubbornness. And it's not that they don't come to church on Sunday or they don't want to go to school or don't. I'm talking about to a point where they refuse relentlessly. When we let that kind of spirit come into the church, it can lead to some major issues. Let me read you about some of the things the word says about laziness. And I'm going to pop these up on the board. You can turn them if you want to. But Proverbs 10.4 says this, lazy hands make for poverty, but diligent hands bring wealth. Proverbs 12, 11 says, those who work their land will have abundant food, but those who chase fantasies have no sense. Proverbs 12, 24 says, diligent hands will rule, but laziness ends in forced labor. Proverbs 13, 4 says, a sluggard's appetite is never filled, but the desires of the diligent are fully satisfied. Proverbs 14, 23 says, all hard work brings a profit, but mere talk leads only to poverty. That's just the beginning is that if you type in what the Bible says about being lazy, it's going to bring up pages and pages upon scriptures that tell you that it brings nothing but poverty destruction, forced labor, and everything else. So when we have that spirit amongst us, it brings the spirit of the church down. So church, what I tell you this morning is, is beware of the lazy dog. My second dog, go ahead and pop the picture up there for you. This is Apollo Blue. Complete opposite to Marvel. This is a blue-haired chihuahua. They have long hair. They're not like the little chihuahuas that you see in the Taco Bell commercial. They have long hair. This dog is hilarious. But some of you have already hopped ahead of me and know what I'm going to say about the chihuahua. The chihuahua is known to be a little bit of a yappy dog. All right? Go ahead and pop that second picture up. That's actually him sticking his tongue out <laughs> at my girlfriend while she's taking this picture. He seriously did that right in the middle of a picture. So uh, that pic I just had to show because it kind of embodies that spirit of what a yappy 
dog is. Chihuahuas are oftentimes referred to as that yappy dog, and they may be small, but they have a big personality and plenty to say about it. These dogs bark no matter what the situation is. And I have a funny story to tell real quick. My girlfriend's brother and her father cut down this huge pine tree in their yard. After it got cut down and fell across their land into the, like the river area, they went to go survey what, you know, everything to be sure they can get the come along rope they had tied up. They can get that out. They couldn't get it out, make sure nothing was destroyed, whatever. So we went back to the house while they were out in the woods. Apollo had not been out, so we let Apollo go run out there. And he heard the noises and he heard him talking in the woods. And when he hears noises in the woods, the first thing he does is start to bark. So all the way out to the foot of where you can go into the woods, he's barking. Bark, 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 all the way. You hear it getting distance away. Now her father and her, and her brother are coming back, walking through. But Apollo doesn't know who it is. As soon as they get into the clearing, that dog let out the most blood-curdling shriek of a bark that I ever heard in my life and hightailed it back the other direction. But it's funny because this yappy dog, even though frightened, even though unsure, still had a lot to say. Isn't that kind of funny? Isn't that kind of funny? That it's in every situation, every circumstance, this yappy dog has something to say. Let's look at James 1.19 and what it says about the tongue. Know this, my beloved brothers. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Let's jump forward to James 3, 5 through 8. It says, so also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and, and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no human can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. It's a little bit serious when we're talking about something that can't be tamed by man. So talking about this yappy dog, why is it that this thing can cause so much damage but being so small, especially in the mouth of that little chihuahua? The tongue has a great potential to do amazing things, but one untamed can cause destruction beyond even your control. We are not meant to be people that focus on our voice to be a representation of who we are. But what is the human condition? We want to speak first. Church, I warn you, beware of the yappy dog. If you experience that person in your life, that all they want to do is talk. All they want to do is say something. But nothing in their actions back it up. Nothing in who they are backs it up. We have a lot of promises, a lot of potential, a lot of greatness to be something amazing in this city, in this town, because of what Christ placed upon us and gave us the ability to do. But if we don't beware of these dogs, it can be destroyed just like that. Amen, everybody. Well, I did it a little different, amen? Training people on what is right and wrong can be difficult at times because everyone has a different background. And if you have not changed some of those thoughts of the past or present uh, can become to become a Christian, uh, it would be one of the hardest things that you could ever do. Your training has to be biblically correct. And it will require strict obedience to be better than you were yesterday. What is being said, um, I'm, I'm, I have two dogs. Uh, and I have chosen these to talk about. It is the Beagle and the Basenji. No, I don't have no pictures. The Beagle is an adorable and playful dog. 
but can be equally annoying when it comes to training. When you get down to training beagles, they are one of the most stubborn breeds. Actually, beagles are an independent and proud breed. Every time you command a beagle, there is a chance that he will give you a look that says, why should I? And trust me, getting down on your knees and begging them to listen doesn't matter either. A Basenji has a unique temperament, which is one way describes is one way to describe it. I must say the only good thing about this song, dog is that it is barkless, meaning it won't say a mumbling word. But what makes him one of the most horrible dogs to train to obey is that it is self-serving. It has selective hearing mm. and strong and independent personality. A Basenji dog doesn't see why it should please anyone. Instead, this dog will attempt to trick you into providing what he wants. These two dogs come from the hound family, which reminds me, you ain't nothing but a hound dog <laughs> crying all the time. I, I meant to do that. <laughs> the one thing about this song is what is interesting about this song when I looked it up is that the hound dog was aimed at a woman who was characterized with the attributes of unfaithfulness and complaining. The finishing of that song says, well, you ain't never caught a rabbit, and you ain't no friend of mine. Whoo, Jesus. These hound dogs can be annoying, independent, and self-centered. You cannot expect these hound dogs to be cooperative because they let their nosy desires make all the decisions because they are driven by their sense of smell. Which means when these dogs start smelling themselves, they become attracted to the selfish gain and run to chase after what they want without the commands of obedience. These two breeds of hound dogs all can happen to have this same mentality even if they're well trained. Paul gives us a great warning as to what to do when dealing with these certain dogs of the world. But Jesus also addresses these hound dogs in Matthew 23, starting at verse 1, and I'm reading the NLT version. It says, then Jesus said to the crowd of his disciples, the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees are the official interpreters of the law of Moses. Verse 3 says, so practice and obey whatever they tell you, but do not follow their example, for they don't practice what they teach. They crush people with unbearable religious demands and never lift a finger to ease the burden. Jesus was speaking to the multitudes and his disciples of this church. But he was preaching loud enough so that the scribes and the Pharisees could hear. I mean, so the hound dogs could hear. A year earlier, Jesus had begun warning the disciples of the teachings of these hound dogs by calling them hypocrites. 
the character was so bad that Jesus came out to point and warning that the, denouncing these Pharisees in public. And seeing that these hound dogs was at church that morning, it was not hard for them to not hear what Jesus was saying. It is funny how these hound dogs can hear what you want them to hear when you're talking about them, when they are the topic of discussion. Jesus' intention in speaking loudly was to warn the multitude to listen. And are his followers, they are not to be hound dogs mentally. Amen? Do not take on the hound dog mentality. With all that being said, this brings me to the question, what are you afraid of? Because I didn't get the opportunity to preach this, I'm going to bring you a word that says metathesiophobia. The origination of this word is a Greek word, which meta means change, phobos means fear. Simply said, the fear of change. Metothesiophobia, which is a fear of metamorphosis. Change is an inev inevitable. No one can avoid it. No one can deny it. But there are some who fear it. I say all that to say that calling ourselves Christians mean that the word of God doesn't challenge, if the word of God doesn't challenge you, then it definitely cannot change you. So let me make one declaration clear about change. God never changes. And nothing about him changes. The character traits such as love, mercy, kindness, justice, and wisdom always exist in perfection in Jesus. I could really dig this up for you, but Jehara only gave me a few minutes. God never changes, but people do. Our bodies, brains, ideas, and values all change. In fact, God built into us the ability to change. Part of being created in God's image is that men and women cannot think, can think, reason, and can come to a conclusion separate from your physical and uh, 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 material gain. Amen? It's separate from all that. Amen? Once you are in Christ, everything should change. John 3 and 3 says, Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. Unless you were born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Which means our ideas of change, our perspectives will change. Our values and actions change to line up with God's word. So calling yourself a Christian and continuing to be a hound dog does not reap the harvest of God's blessings. As the Holy Spirit's work within us, we find that the old has gone and the new is here. 2 Corinthians 5 and 17 says, if, and I emphasize the word if, anyone be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away, behold, all things become new. The Christian life is an ongoing series of changes. As we grow in knowledge, faith, and holiness, we grow in Christ. And growth requires change. Jeff preached the stages of that thing last week perfectly. In the book of John, chapter 5, Jesus found a man that was in the Bible called invalid, who suffered the condition of disability for 38 years. What was very interesting was Jesus asked him a question. Do you want to be well? From my point of view and from maybe many of yours, this is a very strange question. But it has a reasonable purpose for change. Because before the Lord can introduce to any man 
what is godly change, he has to know if you really want it. Or are you more comfortable with the life of changelessness and acting like you don't hear the Lord speaking to your dying condition? Or are you really ready for change? There can be an assumption made that some people believe that God's word must change to adapt to their conditions. However, Jesus strongly, strongly justified the scriptures that are of truth. And he said in Matthew eight and, or 5 and 18, I tell you the truth, that heaven and earth will uh, that heaven and earth, until heaven and earth disappear, not one jot of one tittle of his word will fail. Amen? I leave you with this. For this, for those who are fighting with people who won't change, stop. God left us with the power of preach word on our tongue, and a plan. He told us when people neglect to hear, dust your feet off and keep it moving. Beware of the hound dog. I love dogs a lot. Um, I have a dog and it's not the dog that I expected. Um, at home. So uh, my wife and I, Jenny, had a dog uh, who we had to put down after a few years because it got cancer and all this stuff. So after that dog, two years ago, we were like, we're not getting a dog again. And then a year without a dog, I said, we should get a dog again. Um, so I started looking. Our previous dog was a hundred pound yellow lab full of energy. And I said, maybe something a little calmer. So I started looking up dogs, and I found a dog called a Pomsky, okay? A Pomsky is where they take a Pomeranian and a Husky, and they mash them together, and you get this cute little ball of fluff that looks like a Husky, but doesn't have as much energy as a Husky. And that's what I got, and I was tricked, because I just got a full-blown Husky. Um, <laughs> I'm going to admit it before all of you right now, I still try to think it's a Pomsky, but I have a... 45 pound husky at home and this dog loves to torment our cat <laughs> this dog will get up in the morning and see the cat across the room and get real low and start to like crawl kind of walk kind of crawl and then it pounces on the cat I have a prowling dog at home, a prowling dog. Here's the problem with a prowling dog. A prowling dog doesn't stop until it gets what it wants. David, in scripture, came across this. We're gonna look at Psalm 59. And the context is given to us for this psalm. Some psalms it's not. This one it's given at the top, and it says, for context, when Saul, King Saul, had sent men to watch David's house in order to kill him. David says this in Psalm chapter 59, verse 6 and 7. It'll be on the screens. He says, they return at evening, snarling like dogs, prowl around the city, See what they spew from their mouths. They spew out swords from their lips, and they say, who could hear us? And he goes on to say in verse 14 and 15, they return, same people, same psalm, they return at evening, snarling like dogs and prowl around the city. They wander around for food and howl if they are not satisfied. We're being told to beware of dogs this morning. And as I was studying and I came across this scripture, my mind went to 
the persecuted church. And how the persecuted church worldwide comes across this problem. It's people legitimately hunting them. Now, sometimes we hear in America, and I'm not meaning to discount anyone's situation, but sometimes we feel like we're persecuted as Christians here. Uh, you can tell me your situation after, but I don't, I don't know if we understand what persecution is. We have the opportunity to be meeting here this morning. Openly, across the street from a police station, we don't know what persecution is. So my first point is, we need to beware of persecution so that we can be praying for those who are persecuted, right? My second point is, we need to beware to watch out for persecution because scripture tells us that as believers, we may be persecuted. And it gives us in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12 and 14, it tells us, scripture tells us how we should respond to persecution. Because I think a lot of us, oh, it's already up there, a lot of us, when we respond to persecution, when we respond to suffering, wouldn't respond in this way. It says this, 1 Peter 4, 12. It says, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful trial you are suffering, as though something strange were happening to you. Right? It's not strange. You, were, you know this is going to happen. Verse 13. But rejoice. Rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. See, sometimes when we have to beware of something, we beware of it because we still have to cross its path. Right? So we need to make sure that we have the correct mindset, that we have the correct response when persecution may come. Right? Paul, as he speaks, says that he prays that when he faces persecution, that he would have the faith to stand firm on who Christ is. Right? Peter walked with Christ, and when it came, no, I don't know him. Right? We have to watch out for, we have to beware of these prowling dogs. But when they come, we need to rejoice all the more. My second dog is the stray dog. The stray dog. And there's where, here's what I want you to think. Have you ever seen the video? I don't know, maybe I have a weird Facebook, but sometimes I scroll through Facebook and this video, it's always the same one. There's a dog though, and it's like hiding in this dirty alley, like snarling, and there's this dog catcher guy like trying to get it, right? And you can't even get close to it. You can't even get close to the stray dog, but the person doesn't give up, right? The person in the video continues to try to get the dog. And the video goes on to show this person getting the dog, taking it home, like hand feeding it so that it learns to trust them. And coming to a place near the end of the video where the dog is a rehabilitated member of that household. This is the idea of a stray dog. The stray dog is rehabilitated back into the family. Ecclesiastes verse, or chapter 9, verse 3 and 4, says, This is the evil in everything that happens under the sun. The same destiny overtakes all. The hearts of men, moreover, are full of evil, and there is madness in their hearts while they live and afterward they join the dead. He says, the writer of Ecclesiastes says, this is what's so wrong with everything. There's evil in the world. 
People live evil lives, and then they come to death. That's the most evil thing. Then he goes on to say in verse 4, anyone who is among the living has hope. It's good news. Even a live dog is better off than a dead lion. So a little bit of context. Lions in Scripture, although obviously a nuisance if they're around, (laughs) were a picture of courage and power right when when a a lion is used in scripture generally it's used to show a reverence it's like a healthy fear like wow that lion is strong i'm gonna i'm gonna stay away and, and observe from a distance but wow that thing is really majestic really cool the idea of a dog in scripture pastor jay made this clear at the beginning. I'm going to make it clear again. The picture of a dog in scripture is not my very playful, energetic, loving, loves to cuddle husky. It's not this domesticated house pet. The picture of a dog in scripture is gluttony. (laughs) It's that they scavenge and they devour They're mangy. They're gross. Dogs are disgusting. That's the idea of a dog in Scripture. So when this passage, Ecclesiastes 9 verse 4, says that even a live dog is better off than a dead lion, they're saying a live dog, a live mangy, nasty, evil thing, still has hope. Here's why I bring this up. Because I don't want us to become that pointing dog that Pastor Jehara talked about first, right? If we walk away from here going, yeah, I need to beware of dogs. Those things are gross, right? Got to watch out for the pointing dog. I got to, oh, I think there's a, um, I think there's a lazy dog over there. I think that there's a yappy dog. They're just talking all the time. I know that person. They're, we're becoming the pointing dog, right? Do you understand? We can't become the pointing dog either. Everyone, everyone has a chance in the family of God. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 23 through 26. It says this, Do not have anything to do with foolishness and stupid arguments because you know they produce quarrels. So he's saying, don't be a part of these things, right? Verse 24. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome. Instead, he must be kind to everyone. Even the happy dog, even the lazy dog, even the pointing dog. Even the able to teach, not resentful. Those who oppose him, he must gently instruct. We must gently instruct. So if we beware of these dogs so far as to put them outside of the church, put them outside of all of our relationships, who's going to be there to gently instruct? in hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth. That's what the writer of Ecclesiastes is saying. The living person has more hope than the dead person. If they're living, do these things. And that they will come to their senses and escape the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. With all of these dogs, with all of these ideas, know that our goal is to spread the gospel to these dogs. Our goal is to be humble enough to go, maybe I've been one of these dogs, maybe I am one of these dogs, but I can do better. 
I can instruct. I can help someone who is that stray dog go from being a stray dog to being in the house, to being home. Amen. Let us stand to our feet around the house, amen, as we get ready to walk out of here. I uh, want to share one last piece with you, amen. I want to share one last portion, amen. We found 12 o'clock, and I'm grateful for my, my co-laborers in this place, but I would be remiss, and I don't know that we would be city of light if we did not bring up one more dog. And this one final dog is called the underdog. As I get ready to close, I want to make sure I lay before your feet this group called the underdog. These are the dogs that everyone in life expects to fail. The ones that you never, ever expected to make it. I'm talking about the underdog. I've heard these be called the runts of the litter. The underdogs, the one that you feel bad for as soon as you set your eyes on them. The underdog. The ones who have a very slim chance of making it in any sense. The underdogs, P12, the ones that might be sick and they might be frail, they may be a little bit feeble when you first meet them. I'm talking about the underdog today, right? The ones who, who may not know where their next paycheck is coming from, the underdogs. The ones who are struggling to make it day in and day out. I'm talking about the underdog, Mike. I stopped by to tell you this morning that even if you feel like today you might be the underdog not to give up. A, a couple weeks ago, you guys know that I'm a Jets fan. A couple weeks ago, we the proverbial underdogs, right? We, we, it's truth, it's okay. But, but we were expected to lose to a team called the Titans. And somehow... Sister Tammy, we, we pulled it out. Even as the underdog, right? The, the problem with this whole concept of underdog is as much as I love you, Brother Sean, I think we've been spelling this whole thing wrong. We've been saying underdog. Instead, I meant to say under God. If you take the word dog and flip it, what those things that are once underdogs, actually, if you put them under God, things start to change around for us a little bit, right? So you have underdog situations. You have underdog people. But you put that underdog under God and everything starts to change. Somebody needs to hear me as we get out of here. Somebody understands because you might have felt like the underdog and you might have been in this underdog situation until you realize if it had not been for the Lord on your side, where would you be? Somebody wouldn't be alive today if not being the underdog that fell under God. And then I, I started to continue flipping these words around. And so as we realized that Brother Sean mixed up the spell, and I love you, Brother Sean, it was supposed to say under God. What if this said instead of beware of dog, it said beware of God? What if, what, if, what if in the midst of your situation, wherever you are and whatever you got going on, I want you to beware of God. Beware of what God thinks about you. Beware of the fact he sent Jesus to die for you. Beware of God. It doesn't matter what the situation looks like. Beware of God in it. It might be tough. It might be painstaking. It might cause anxiety, but beware of God in there. Beware of God. Oh, I don't know if this situation is too messy for him. Nonsense. Beware of God. Oh, everybody gave up on me. It doesn't matter. Beware of God. I haven't been affirmed in years, Pastor. I was born to run. You don't even know my story. Beware of God. Beware of God. Beware of God in the midst of here. Beware of what God thinks about you. He thought that you were worth saving. He thought you were worth saving. He would send his son, Jesus. Beware of God. Beware of the love he has. That Jesus wouldn't just come and live a life, but Jesus said, I'll come and be a sacrifice. Beware of God. Beware of what he thinks about you. He thinks you're worth dying for. But that's not where the story ended. He also thought you were worth rising for. Hallelujah, somebody. <laughs> beware of God. As we get ready to exit this place, I just encourage you to beware of God. And I'm not saying that it's not painful. I'm not saying that, that this whole year hasn't been a trying year. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying beware of God. 
Sometimes we put our focus on what he isn't doing and we miss completely what he has done and what he is doing. Beware of God and where you are. Beware of God. Oh man, this thing hurts and, and it's allowed to, but beware of God. It's more than I can bear. He understands this. Beware of God is right there with you. We're not talking about a father that does not come and inhabit the praises. We're not talking about a Holy Spirit that does not come and live where we are. Beware. Can you just tell somebody, beware of God? Beware of God. In the pain, still beware of God. Because in those spaces, when you put these underdogs under God, city of light, a church that was supposed to be the underdog. A church that they said it wouldn't work, and it certainly, it certainly ain't going to work in the middle of a pandemic. <laughs> but you put the underdog under God. The, the underdog. The, the marriage that everybody gave up on, the one that wasn't supposed to stand a chance, the, the, the underdog put it under God. The diagnosis, the diagnosis, the prognosis that they said, hmm, put it under God. Can you pray with me? Father, we do thank you again for an opportunity to hear from you, Lord, as we walk in, we've listened for your, for your voice, oh God, Lord, we want to be that church like the Philippian church, that is an overall good standing, oh God, a church that lives well, a church that loves well, oh God, a church that listens well, but oh God, Lord, we realize that there are some who have fallen, oh God, Lord, and have, 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 have begun to carry this underdog spirit. But, oh, God, we ask that you would show us to put ourselves still in this state under you, oh, God. We would ask right now, Father, let anybody and all that are hurting and are, 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 are broken and bereaved in this moment, Lord, that we would place them under you, God. Lord, I pray, oh, God, Lord, for, for, for the Sexton family in particular, oh, God, Lord. Lord, we pray, oh, God, Lord, for those who are hurting in this moment, in this hour, oh, God, Lord. We pray for the marriages, oh, God, that are under attack, Lord, that they're still under you, oh, God. We pray, Heavenly Father, for the physical bodies, Lord, that were given the, 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 the percentage, uh, uh, this, this, this likelihood of living as, as that of a runt, oh God, we put it under you, God. We're aware of you. We're aware of you, oh God, in all these places. And so we would ask right now, even, Lord, in those deep places in our heart, that you would begin to speak, Lord, that you would begin to love us, Lord, as though we were the underdogs. We're encouraged, oh God, Lord, because you loved us. We encourage Jesus because you came, you hung, you bled, you died, and you rose. And because you conquered the grave, we no longer have to be the underdog. Lord, we just ask you right now to bless the places that we call home, that when we arrive back to them, Lord, they'd be in even better condition than the way that we left them. Speak to our hearts as we walk out of this place today that in all that we do and everywhere that we go, that we are aware of you, God. Lord, that we might hear to beware of you, God. That we don't end up like these dog, with these dog spirits, Lord, pointing and, and casting judgment, snarling and prowling, oh God, Lord, lazy and stubborn, hard to teach and hard to train. Lord, we don't want to be that. Instead, we want to beware of you, God. So we do love you and thank you again, Lord, for all the things that are happening in our life. We would pray, oh God, that you would bless us throughout this week, that you would bless us as a church, as a community, oh God, Lord, that the gun buyback program be a success. Lord, that, that, that the field trip, Heavenly Father, Lord, to, the, to Noah's um, maze, oh God, Lord, be a success. We would pray, oh God, Lord, that the ministries that you've birthed here would continue to be outreaching and a success. We would pray, oh God, Lord, that next week, Lord, our youth Sunday would be a success. We would pray, oh God, Lord, that in all that we're going through, even the tough things, that we are fully aware of you, God. But Father, Lord, we will not try to dim light on all the great things you're doing. So we do love you today, Father. We thank you and we praise you for City of Light, the underdog church that's falling under you, God. We love you today. We thank you and we praise you. And it's in Jesus' name we all together said.